You're probably wondering, why is this trolley video opening with a diesel train? It was here, beside these abandoned passenger platforms at the historic North Toronto Station, that I discovered a historic milestone in the story of the Young Line. Let's go back to a time when the streetcar was king of the road and the subway a promise for the future. More than half a century before this station was built, the only transportation on Young Street was private carriages. Mass transportation in the form of horse-drawn omnibuses began in 1849, a few miles from here in Yorkville. Regular service carried six and later ten passengers from the Red Lion Hotel to the St. Lawrence Market. In 1861, the City of Toronto gave a 30-year charter to the Toronto Street Railway Company. Canada's first streetcar line was built on Young Street connecting the St. Lawrence Market on King to the Yorkville Town Hall. The vehicles of the day were open cars with four wheels bolted directly to the body sills. For passengers on the closed cars, a liberal sprinkling of straw kept their feet warm in winter. A small coal oil lamp set in one end of the car provided the only light. The driver stood on the open front platform exposed to the weather. The horse car system expanded as the city's population grew. The lower part of Young was double track between King and Queen, and the area became the retail center of the city. Even in these early days of transit on Young, passenger volume was such that heavier streetcars pulled by two horses were used to travel to the old North Toronto station at Price Street. It was on the other side of the tracks at Birch Street where history was made. The Metropolitan Street Railway Company of Toronto was incorporated in 1878 and originally provided horse car service on Young from the city limits north to Eglinton Avenue in the county of York. The officers of the company were impressed with electric traction in Pittsburgh, but even more so with the new electric railway in St. Catharines, which was opened in 1887. The ability of electric cars to negotiate hills prompted them to electrify the Young Line north from the CPR tracks to Glen Grove on September 2nd, 1890, a full two years before the TSR's city line. Meanwhile, the city took over operation of the Toronto Street Railway Company after its franchise had ended. It granted the Toronto Railway Company a new 30-year charter expiring August 31st, 1921. The new company electrified the aging horse car system and began building new electric cars. One of the new cars built was 306, as seen in 1961, running around with Trailer 64 on the private track at Hillcrest Shops. Number 306 was one of 75 new cars built by the TRC in its own shops and first placed in service in November of 1892. The cars were fashioned after similar cars in Boston. Originally, they had open platforms at each end, with openings in the dashboard to permit access to the converted horse car trailers. When single-ended operation began, the front platforms were semi-enclosed with a door to protect the motorman from the weather. Number 306 escaped the enclosing of that rear platform, however. Retired from active service in 1921, it and Trailer 64 form part of the TTC's historic collection, which is in storage at Ottawa's National Museum of Science and Technology. Car 327 is one of a group of odd-numbered open cars originally built in 1893. It ran until 1915 when side-running boards were banned. 
This 1934 replica is the only example of turn-of-the-century made-in-Canada vehicles. It is currently operating at the Halton County Radio Railway Museum at Rockwood, Ontario. The trip along the Young Line was a challenge for passengers and pedestrians alike. The single truck cars had a jolting ride. The open cars were at the mercy of the weather and could not be used in winter. It was with some rejoicing by passengers that small heater stoves were installed in the cars in 1892. The pedestrians were used to slow moving carts and wagons. When a streetcar came barreling down the track at eight miles per hour, there were the inevitable accidents. Safety fish nets and later fenders were installed on the car's front. The Toronto Railway Company expanded their system to other parts of the city, but the small single truck cars with their old horse car trailers were unable to handle the increased patronage. As early as 1895, the TRC, as the Toronto Railway Company was called, pioneered the development of a larger double truck car, which had straight sides and an enclosed front platform to protect the motorman and his controls. These closed cars made their inaugural runs on Young Street. With vehicle safety in mind, all double truck cars were equipped with air brakes in 1905. The TRC was a private concern and unlike today was not swayed by public opinion with regards to its policies. When the company attempted to standardize their cars to the pay-as-you-enter system, the public rioted. It seems that passengers were no longer able to smoke on the rear platform because the conductor was now stationed there to collect fares. This prompted a total ban on smoking on the cars. Passengers had little regard for their own safety and there was little room for smoking or anything else on the young car's rear platform, except for hanging on for dear life. The motormen and the conductors were a hardy lot as the hazards of electric cars were many. The extension of double track throughout the city continued. While all these improvements were being made, ridership steadily increased and the Young Line was becoming more congested. The Toronto Railway Company's 30-year charter was coming to an end and the company was not maintaining its track and equipment as well as it had in the beginning. To add to the problem, the Toronto Railway Company refused to extend its lines beyond the limits set out in its charter. Between 1891 and 1910, the city began annexing nearby communities and was thus forced to build its own car lines to service these areas. The CPR tracks at Young and Birch Streets form the boundary between the city line to the south and the metropolitan line to the north. The steam railway company would not allow the streetcars to cross their tracks at grade and thus new terminals were located on either side of the tracks. Passengers would have to pay an extra fare to ride into the city. The CPR track was the battleground that established city control over electric railways on Young Street. The Metropolitan Line had extended its passenger and freight service north to Lake Simcoe. Their revenues had increased and they wanted access to the St. Lawrence Market downtown. They replaced the streetcars with interurban cars. Meanwhile, the city annexed the area north of the CPR tracks to Farnham Avenue. It was adamantly against any radio lines running on city streets. The courts upheld the city's position. City track had a different gauge from that of other railways to prevent this very thing. When the Toronto and York Metropolitan Lines franchise expired in 1915, the city paid the Toronto Railway Company to extend the track north from Price Street to the new city limit, creating the first Young Street car extension. The radial track was promptly torn up and passengers now transferred between the lines on the street at Farnham Avenue. This city extension eventually led to the demise of the radial service as the city gained control of the most profitable section. Young cars now passed under a new subway at a new North Toronto station. Public transportation had become an essential service in the growth of Toronto and it was with that in mind that city voters ended private streetcar franchises. The Toronto Transportation Commission, or TTC as it was called, was created in 1920 as an independent body, free from local politics and entirely self-sustaining on its own revenues. On September 1, 1921, four different streetcar companies were amalgamated into one with a unified fare structure. The TTC was in business. The first thing that they did was order new rolling stock. 
Concerned about quick loading and unloading of passengers on its busy young line, the TTC chose Cleveland's Peter Witt streetcar design with its front entrance, center exit, door configuration. They promptly ordered and took delivery of 140 cars from the Canadian Car and Foundry of Montreal. These were two-man cars. The motorman drove the car and the conductor collected the fares as the passengers went by him. The only problem the public had with these cars was with the wood seats, an uncomfortable change from the plush velvet seats of the older cars. A successor to the potbelly stove still heated the cars, but the way the rush hour crowds were jammed in, most passengers kept warm in winter by body heat alone. Along with the initial car purchase was an order for 60 trailers. By the end of 1921, the trailer trains were a permanent fixture on the Young Line. This was the end of the line for the Metropolitan Cars' journey to the city. The TTC, as part of its two-year track program, extended double track north from Farnham Avenue, up Young, past Heath Street, to the new city limits at Glen Echo. All the single radial track was removed. The old Toronto Railway Company's Yorkfield car house and shops were unsuitable for the new wit cars and trailers. A new car house at Young and Eglinton was the first new car house to be constructed by the TTC. Eglinton Division, as it was called, had a spacious yard which provided ample storage for the new wit streetcars and trailers, as well as dead storage for the Toronto Railway Company cars that were to be scrapped. The Eglinton car house property was a model of efficiency. Track work in the yard was laid out to utilize storage space, permitting easy looping of cars and the rapid addition or removal of trailers. The office building provided accommodation for operating crews and office staff. The car house was provided with repair pits and all the necessary equipment to carry out inspections, maintenance and repair work. When the new division opened in December of 1922, few realized that 32 years later, this would be the northern terminus of the Young Subway. These double-ended cars provided service from Richmond Hill to the new North Toronto Terminal after the Lake Simcoe portion of the line was abandoned in 1930. For three years until abandonment, the TTC operated radial freight service on Young Street from Lake Simcoe to its downtown Sherbin Street shops, an event that City Fathers in pre-TTC days vowed would never happen. The TTC had made plans for expansion of its routes in the 1920s, but the brakes were put on due to the World Depression. The 1930s saw a deep decrease in ridership and revenue. The automobile also had made an impact on the city. In the early days of traffic chaos in Toronto, the main handicap to travel was no stoplights. The first signal lights were installed at Bloor & Young in March of 1927. Another drawback to streetcar movement was parking regulations. There weren't any. People parked where they wanted, when they wanted. There were no clearway or tollway zones in those days. There was trailer train operation on other routes as well as Young Street. There were Bluer trains and King trains and Kingston Road trains that traveled downtown, and for a time Dundas trains. Passengers could not complain about service. In earlier times, the young streetcars made direct connections with the old railway station at Front and Simcoe, on the street adjacent to the present Lotel. When the new Union Station was opened in 1927, the importance of the North Toronto CPR station diminished. This new facility provided fast, convenient connections with the passenger trains from the street. These scenes looking north up Bay Street on Front were filmed to show what effect the automobile was having on streetcar service. Just watch the policeman direct traffic. Can you spot the traffic light? Can you total the number of traffic violations? How many horses appear on the street? These few minutes are a treasure of trivia. Other lines also converged on this location in tripper service, a term used to describe a connecting streetcar line that took its passengers from outlying areas to the downtown core and back. Most of these tripper cars ran only in rush hours. The TTC had a short-lived experiment with six motor trains, a multiple unit streetcar comprised of one car with four motors joined or coupled to the second car with two motors, like a motorized trailer. This idea was based on a similar operation in Montreal. The cars provided Bathurst tripper service, but never ran on Young Street. 
It is quite evident that former Toronto Railway Company cars, which were rebuilt by the TTC, were performing well. If you look up Bay Street, you can see a trailer train on King Street. Now how's that traffic cop doing? These were the good old days. The streetcars were also greatly affected by traffic because of the number of left and right turns they made looping downtown. The Peter Witt cars that operated on the Young Line were called large widths, and the ones that operated on the Bay Line were small widths because they were shorter in length. While the small rough riding trailers of the TRC were not a rider's dream, the new trailers had a similar stigma. It was not all that uncommon to see passengers standing on the lead car or motor, even though there was plenty of room to sit in the trailer. Passengers who rode the trailer trains beyond Eglinton to the city limits would ride the motors, as the expression goes, because it would save them the trouble of having to get off the trailer if it was short-turned at the Eglinton car house. The TTC solved this dilemma by installing signs on the front windows, indicating whether the trailer would be indeed short-turned. It became a game when operators endeavoring to balance the load on the trailer would overshoot the stop, only to have the boarding passenger get on the front car anyway. In 1937, green bullseye lights were mounted on the front roofs of the lead cars, a feature unique to Toronto. These lights alerted passengers at night that a streetcar was approaching. Other improvements were also made. The motorman's cab was opened up, and new foam rubber, leather-covered seats, and electric heaters were installed, a relief for passengers and operators alike. This comfort wasn't extended to the trailers, however, making them even more undesirable to travel in. By the Second World War, traffic on the line was at record levels. Gas and tire rationing meant that Toronto citizens had to take the public transportation. After the war, automobile production resumed. The volume of traffic increased, and the crush of rush hour crowds resulted in gridlock. One could walk up Young Street faster than taking the streetcar. Something had to be done. There had been proposals for a Young Subway as early as 1910. Planning began as early as the 1940s, and when in 1946 city voters overwhelmingly supported the building of the subway, tenders were called for in 1949. 